started. Good morning and thank you for attending our Grand Rounds lecture. I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. Martin Leon as the second Vetrovec Symposium lecturer for the academic year. To tell you briefly about the Vetrovec Symposium, Dr. George Vetrovec was found, the George Vetrovec Symposium was found in 2015 on the occasion of Dr. Vetrovec's retirement. Dr. Vetrovec was chairman of the cardiology department for 18 years and director for the cardiac catheterization lab for 38 years, as well as associate chairman of medicine for clinical affairs for 23 years. He was the first recipient of the Martha and Harold Kimmerling eminent professorship. Dr. Vetrovec focused on improving the management of coronary disease. He performed the first coronary balloon angioplasty at VCU in 1979. After his retirement, he continues as Professor Emeritus, serves as the MCV Foundation Board, the Pauli Heart Center Advisory Board, and the MCV Physicians Board. To go on to our lecturer today, Dr. Martin Leon. He is a professor of medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, director of Columbia Interventional Cardiovascular Care, director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab, and is on the executive board of the Columbia Structural Heart and Valve Center. Dr. Leon is also the founder and chairman emeritus of the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, the CRF. He has served as principal investigator for over 50 clinical trials that have helped shape the field of interventional cardiovascular medicine, including studies such as STRESS, STARS, Gamma-1, Sirius, Endeavor, and most recently, the PARTNER trial. Dr. Leon has co-authored over 1,550 publications, has performed over 10,000 interventional procedures, and has had a major impact as a thought leader and innovator in the expanding subspecialty of interventional cardiovascular device and drug therapies. Dr. Leon is the director and founder of the Transcatheter Cardiovascular Therapeutics, the world's premier interventional cardiovascular meeting and director or co-director of more than 100 international educational programs in areas of interventional cardiology. Dr. Leon has received numerous international career achievement awards and was awarded an honorary degree from the University of Athens. In addition, the American College of Cardiology and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation collaborated in creating the Martin B. Leon Center for Cardiovascular Transformation. We are very grateful for Dr. Leon's expertise on this topic and look forward to learning from him. At the end of the lecture, we will leave time for questions. Please submit questions via the chat function on Zoom as they arise during the talk. We are pleased to offer both CME and MOC credit for our Grand Rounds Conference series. To claim credit for today's session, text the code shown at the beginning and at the end of the presentation to 804-625-4041. For questions or to log into your Cloud CME account, visit vcu.cloud-cme.com. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Leon. Anna, thank you very much. That was a, an extremely kind and generous introduction. Uh, I was particularly interested to, to um, listen to the comments about George Vetrovic, who has been an extraordinary colleague and a close friend for many decades, and truly is one of the iconic figures in interventional cardiology. So to have an opportunity to give a lecture uh, as part of uh, his special symposium uh, for me is a great honor. Um, so uh, thank you, George. Um, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to uh, talk on a topic which is a little bit atypical uh, in that I'm going to uh, try to um, see if I can project into the future and create some controversy in the field of valvular heart disease. Um, so the topic title is called Upstream Management of Aortic Stenosis. These are my financial disclosures. I do work with many startup companies in an opportunity in, in um, uh, a capacity of trying to see how we can further develop new technologies. And you should be aware of that. This is a roadmap for this lecture, and we'll do this in a very deliberate and sequential fashion. First, let me give you at least the conceptual framework around this concept of upstream therapy. From my perspective, aortic stenosis is a continuous disease process. 
And that's either congenital bicuspid or senile calcific degenerative forms. But this continuous process is punctuated by various clinical events. It could be an episode of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the onset of cardiac symptoms. And concomitant, there are cardiac structural changes, such as LVH, pulmonary hypertension, and even right heart failure. We believe that earlier management, both diagnosis and treatment, leads to optimal clinical outcomes. And delaying progression of calcific AS before the onset of symptoms or the need for AVR should be an aspirational goal. And the clinical research efforts should shift from what we're doing now, which is largely late stage reactive AVR to early stage preemptive AVR and other complementary therapy approaches. And finally, the availability of less invasive, low risk transcatheter technologies combined with more durable heart valves, which is clearly a work in progress, coupled to enhanced and easily accessible early diagnosis should transform AS patient management paradigms in the future. So that's our conceptual framework. And perhaps we should begin at the beginning, which is with this classic manuscript more than 50 years ago by Ross and Brownwald in circulation, outlining the natural history of aortic stenosis, basically from a retrospective necropsy report on a handful of patients with largely rheumatic heart disease, pointing out the grave prognosis that appears to accompany the onset of certain symptoms. And this figure, which is likely the most recognized figure in all of cardiology, which is the Ross Brownwald depiction of the natural history of aortic stenosis. Now, this was not based on data. This was really a visual depiction of what was the conclusion of their retrospective necropsy analysis. But up until a point, there was a latent period where there's worsening valvular heart disease, then the onset of symptoms, and as if falling off a cliff at that point, prognosis becomes dire and mandates early therapy. Now, in the past 50 years, the only major change in this figure is the recognition that since that was largely rheumatic disease and patients became symptomatic younger, perhaps in their 60s, we now face a disease which is largely associated with aging. And that, that transition to a symptom phase occurs much later in life. But we think there are two fundamental fallacies. First, that there are no important reversible and irreversible structural changes that occur during this so-called latent period, which negatively impact subsequent clinical outcomes. So if you simply ignore what's happening up until the point with symptoms, to a large extent, you may have missed the boat. And the second fallacy is that the onset of symptoms is discrete, easily identifiable, even in the elderly, where it can be very difficult to, to target symptom onset, and that it's inexorably linked to aortic stenosis severity and to myocardial changes. So to us, these are the two fallacies that we've been living with and largely ignoring. Now, I had an opportunity at the Heart Valve Society two years ago um, to speak to Dr. Brownwald and to honor him at the 50th anniversary of the publication of this circulation manuscript. You see many um, uh, a key people on this slide. You see, of course, Dr. Brownwald in the front and Bob Bonner, who is one of my mentors, a current editor of JAMA Cardiology and an expert in valvular heart disease. Alain Cribier, uh, the, the first a structural interventionalist uh, to implant a transcatheter valve. And he readily admitted that those early observations and that initial uh, report was overly simplistic. And in fact, that we should move on from that early concept. And he pointed to a publication that we were involved in the year before. First author was Philippe Genereau, looking at a staging classification in severe aortic stenosis. These are patients from the so-called partner trial, either a, um, patients that randomized to either surgery or to transcatheter therapy, over 1,600. And we did a very careful echo staging 
assessment of these patients at the time of aortic valve replacement, which usually was associated with the onset of symptoms. I think what you can see is that we've divided this up into multiple stages from no cardiac damage to patients that have LV damage from the standpoint of hypertrophy or diastolic dysfunction or systolic dysfunction, um, uh, what we begin to see in the left atrium with atrial fibrillation or functional mitral regurgitation, left atrial enlargement, pulmonary hypertension, and then worsening TR ultimately resulting in RV dysfunction. And what we observe, now remember, these are patients that are about to be treated, but 85%, 85% of these patients already have beyond class one cardiac damage. So at the time of AVR, based upon symptoms, only 15% of the patients had relatively mild associated cardiac disease. And much of the disease we're talking about is reversible. Much of it is irreversible at this stage. And a quarter of these patients who have evidence of the dominant symptom shortness of breath don't recover completely from the standpoint of symptom benefit. If we look at the one-year mortality after AVR in this patient population, you can see that it grades precisely to the degree of staged cardiac damage. So in that small number of patients that were symptomatic and had very little cardiac damage, the one-year mortality was only four and a fraction percent. But if you had stage four cardiac damage, it was 25%. So obviously, prognosis is tied not just to the severity of aortic stenosis, but, the to, but to the degree of cardiac damage incurred during this so-called latent period. Now, those are patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. What about patients that have moderate aortic stenosis and, in fact, are not symptomatic? This is work that we did with Jerome Bax, who has an extraordinary longitudinal database in Leiden, the Netherlands, where he tracks patients um, periodically with imaging and with clinical assessments. And it's a large database that gives you a sense as to the natural history of treated and untreated valvular heart disease. Over 1,200 patients. And again, he did a similar analysis using these same staging criteria. And what he found was that even in moderate aortic stenosis, at a time when essentially the majority of these patients were asymptomatic, two thirds still had evidence of cardiac damage. So clearly we're talking about a disease that progresses beyond the leaflet hemodynamic severity stage and has an impact on cardiac abnormalities, which track closely with clinical outcomes. If you look at the five-year mortality, again, you see this graded response based upon baseline cardiac damage for five-year mortality and for the combined endpoint of mortality, stroke, and rehospitalization. So to simply say that an asymptomatic moderate AS patient is a benign disease that should be watched with surveillance, I think is something that we should question based upon data like this. So what we're suggesting is that we have two ongoing parallel concomitant processes. We tend to focus on the valve, the hemodynamics, what's happening at the leaflet level, where we spend less time thinking about what's happening as a consequence of chronic afterload burden to the heart. And the treatment dogma is based upon valve-related hemodynamic parameters, not really understanding these parallel processes with variable linkage. We don't really know at what AS severity do we begin seeing adverse cardiac events like mortality, symptoms, cardiac damage. And we believe that there's a wide patient variability in AS afterload tolerance and the expression of adverse events. So this is a situation where we think that personalized and directed understanding of a condition beyond just the valve hemodynamic severity is essential if we're going to achieve optimal treatment of the larger population.
Now, what do the guidelines say? We've got recent guidelines from ESC. We've got guidelines from the ACC and um, uh, AHA. Um, so clearly, and, and we follow the guidelines and uh, we should. Uh, so these are the guidelines, these are the class one recommendations for the timing of intervention for aortic stenosis. And there are five class one recommendations and they are all for severe aortic stenosis. And most of these are with symptoms. There are four 2A recommendations. And those 2A recommendations are all severe aortic stenosis. We've begun to infuse the notion that there are categories of apparently asymptomatic or asymptomatic AS that may require aortic valve replacement, but we're just at the onset of beginning to recognize this as a phenomenon. And there are two class 2B recommendations. Um, and as you can see, one of these is severe AS in somebody that has demonstrated linear progression of LV dysfunction. And the other is a curious recommendation in moderate AS in patients who just happen to be undergoing cardiac surgery for other indications. So that's the only recommendation for treating moderate aortic stenosis in the current guidelines. And it's a 2B recommendation. So clearly the guidelines, and I think that they're very thoughtful, in general still reflect the more traditional downstream clinical practices of severity of disease at the valve level and waiting for the onset of symptoms to react as the trigger for aortic valve replacement. Now I want to raise another issue which should be important to all of you, which is the issue of okay, we have guidelines and they're fairly strict and we try to abide by the guidelines, but how do they translate into clinical practice? These are interesting data. They're from 2015, but it's, a, it's an important snapshot. And it shows you um, uh, the demographic of those patients who received in this country surgical aortic valve replacement. You can see the mean age is between 70 and 75. And these are patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. Now you layer on those patients who are the same year received transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It was almost the same number in total. There's an age shift, obviously, towards the mid 80s because these were higher risk patients, the more elderly AS population. So this kind of makes sense, but let's put this in some perspective. These are the patients who truly have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. We are barely scratching the surface in terms of treatment relative to the patients from an epidemiologic standpoint and disease prevalence have the disease we're talking about. So there is in this country, radical under diagnosis and under treatment of aortic stenosis. This is a manuscript that we wrote with Matthew Brennan from Duke about a year ago, looking at the Optum database in 100 million, in 80 million people, looking at severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And what you can see here is that over 60% of diagnosed symptomatic severe aortic stenosis was untreated. In this, in this case, calendar year 2016, and that was much better than it's been over the last five years with treatment rates increasing now that TAVR has become available as a lesser invasive alternative to surgery. So there's no state in the United States that treats severe symptomatic aortic stenosis more than 25% of the true indicated patients over the first year after diagnosis. Now, what are some of the categories that are least well um, respected from the standpoint of early treatment? Um, let me start with race. Black patients had a 24% less likely opportunity to get AVR, either surgery or TAVR, than white patients. Women were somewhat discriminated against, about 9% less likely than men. But most interestingly, depending upon your managing cardiologist, the doctor that you ultimately saw and his referral patterns for early versus later surgery, that had a profound effect on whether or not you received AVR in a timely fashion. And that correlated directly 
with one year mortality. So there's a lot of work we need to do in order to better recognize and to, um, uh, after diagnosis, um, compel or mandate early treatment with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. This issue of racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities is obviously something we think about all the time. Uh, there is a recent JAMA cardiology publication shown here talking a little bit about aortic valve replacement within major metropolitan areas. Uh, it clearly points out um, that there are differences in major metropolitan populations in this country with TAVR, um, uh, depending upon zip codes, the proportion of Blacks and Hispanics, and those with greater socioeconomic disadvantages that clearly had lower rates of TAVR, even when you adjust for age and clinical comorbidities. Now, is this a disease prevalence difference, or is this simply under treatment for a variety of reasons? That is still being explored and something that needs to be understood. It's an area of special interest of ours. So if we're underdiagnosing and under treating, one of the things you might ask is what are the screening tools for aortic stenosis? And maybe that's part of the problem. And here's a, a little bit of a look into the future. Obviously, aortic stenosis will grow um, with an aging population, as will mitral valve disease. And this is an interesting report looking at the global impact of significant valvular heart disease, moderate or severe, AS or MR, which by 2040 will double compared to what it is now to more than 150 million people. How are we going to treat all these people? How are we going to diagnose them? And that's for significant AS and MR, many of which express themselves clinically. But we've been looking at some interesting ways to be able to screen patients for valvular heart disease. Um, this is a report that came out of the Mayo Clinic published um, earlier this year, uh, looking at a 12 lead ECG uh, and using artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, developing algorithms with pretty good sensitivity and specificity and predictive accuracy uh, to be able to detect significant aortic stenosis just based upon a 12 lead ECG, looking at the raw signals um, of which in a 12 lead ECG there are uh, as many as 6,000 pieces of information. Now we've done some of the same work at Columbia at the Cardiology Bioinformatics Group. And we look not just at AS, but AR and mitral regurgitation. And in a very large number of, um, of people um, looking at 12 lead ECGs, uh, we also were able to develop machine learning algorithms with pretty good predictive accuracy with a pretty good um, uh, um, uh, AUROC, as shown here, uh, to suggest that we may be able to actually start screening patients for significant valvular heart disease with some of these new algorithms using machine learning in the future. And this should be an area that we develop. This is a manuscript in Press and Jack. There's a lot of other work that's been done with machine learning. I'm particularly interested in some of the work done by um, Partho Sangupta, who's looked at echo images and has developed a framework to identify distinct phenotypes of aortic stenosis severity that are most at risk. We need to know who the at-risk population is so that we can properly stratify who should be treated more quickly. And this is one of the techniques that I think will help us to be able to develop that. There's a whole literature emerging in this area. Now, this further builds to a concept that we've been interested in for the past five years, which is preemptive or earlier AVR. Now, we're not unique in thinking this, and there are two um, recent surgical trials looking at early surgical treatment for severe aortic stenosis in patients who are asymptomatic. So this is the asymptomatic group of severe aortic stenosis. This first trial is the recovery trial that was um, uh, um, published earlier this year, um, and it comes out of South Korea. And they looked at a small number of patients, actually, less than 150. These really had critical aortic stenosis. The primary endpoint was mortality 
and they found a dramatic difference in those that had early surgery versus conservative surveillance, which is the standard approach to severe asymptomatic AS. Now, these were really critical AS, very high peak velocities, so maybe it's a rarefied group. Well, just at the AHA meetings and published in circulation just last month was the AVATAR trial. AVATAR trial is from Europe. It's also a small study, 157 asymptomatic severe AS patients, but were also randomized to early surgery or conservative management. Uh, there wasn't a, a, a small operative mortality, which is realistic, and they used the composite primary endpoint of death MI stroke and heart failure rehospitalization. But they also found a 54% difference in surgery, early surgery, versus the conservative or current treatment approach. So this has begun to raise some eyebrows. These are underpowered studies, but certainly speak to the issue that we should be considering preemptive AVR in appropriate patients. I would argue that in 2019, this was one of the most um, uh, oft, often quoted manuscripts in valvular heart disease. This is from the National Echo Database of Australia, NIDA, where they looked at a huge number, a quarter of a million um, uh, patients that had echoes. Looking at the natural history of patients divided up into severity of aortic stenosis. And what you can see on the bottom two lines, moderate and severe aortic stenosis are not very different. Um, and even when you adjust for aortic valve area, um, moderate aortic stenosis is not a benign disease from the standpoint of cumulative survival um, uh, in a large uh, database. Now, Again, this is a database where we're just looking at echo readings. There are some many methodologic issues that, that um, um, you, know, you need to consider. So there may be some misclassification, there may be some challenges, maybe there were some rapid progressors to severe AS, but we would argue there's already too much cardiac damage in many of these moderate AS patients. And in many of these patients, the intervention is simply too late. You've missed the opportunity. Either you've not recognized symptoms or you've allowed cardiac damage to progress relentlessly without intervening. Now we began reacting to some of these concepts about five years ago uh, and started two studies that are, um, um, uh, are coming to, uh, um, they're not quite concluded yet, but you'll hear about them in the future. And these were preemptive earlier TAVR trials one is the early TAVR study, the other is the unload trial. The early TAVR study is the largest severe asymptomatic AS trial ever done. This is a thousand patients, and this is stress test confirmed asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis that were randomized to early TAVR or to watchful waiting, active surveillance, um, uh, and with a composite endpoint um, at two years looking at all-cause mortality, looking at strokes, and looking at uh, repeat hospitalizations. Um, so this is an interesting trial, um, and we completed enrollment in the full study cohort last week. So we'll have data before too long, but this certainly will be a landmark study in preemptive or earlier TAVR treatment. Now, at the same time, we started another study, which is more of a hypothesis-generating trial. It's called the UNLOAD trial. We have been seeing more and more patients with moderate aortic stenosis and clinical heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The guidelines don't say anything about how to treat these patients. And we've observed that earlier TAVR tends to allow you to be more effective in your medical therapy. And we believe improve symptoms and outcomes. So we began a trial just to test that concept. And Nick Van Meegan has been one of the leaders in this um, from Rotterdam, I've worked with him. Um, we're about half enrolled in this clinical trial, but again, a preemptive trial in moderate AS, but moderate AS with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure symptoms. At the same time over the past five years, there's been a flurry of data in the literature talking about at-risk predictors of moderate aortic stenosis for poor outcomes. And just to summarize, these are the things that have come out of fairly extensive investigations from multiple different sources. 
First, if you have cardiac symptoms with moderate AS, especially class three or four heart failure, that is an at-risk predictor for earlier mortality. Obviously a low ejection fraction, but the cutoff is not 50%, which is what most people think it should be 60%. Atrial fibrillation, either persistent or recent paroxysmal, a low stroke volume, severe diastolic dysfunction, the ability to discern rapid AS progression, elevated biomarkers, in this case, looking at BNP, and an elevated calcium score. And in this analysis, um, and Nick Van Meegan was one of the principal authors of a significant number of patients, they compared HEFREF with moderate AS without intervention. And you can see the five-year mortality is over 70%. If you intervene, that mortality is substantially reduced. Uh, another area um, uh, of, of study that confirmed some of these observations was some of the work again done by Jerome Bax and his, um, uh, his group, in this case, Jan Stassen. This is in press. Uh, it's a collaborative study that we've done uh, looking at his uh, longitudinal database in moderate AS patients, looking at left ventricular ejection fraction as being a predictor of outcomes. Without going into too much of the detail, you can see here that the combined endpoint of mortality or the need for AVR clearly stratified based upon ejection fraction. And if you look at these spline curves, the cutoff seems to be around 60% and not 50% where you begin to see negative events. Now the guidelines for moderate AS, we said, the definition of moderate AS is pretty well established. Um, and, and this has been confirmed and has been pretty well enacted. It's a peak velocity of three to four, a mean gradient of 20 to 40, and a valve area of one to one five. That's a fairly wastebasket group, many of which have some degree of low flow, um, low gradient AS. But the guidelines for treatment include that one category 2B that we mentioned, and even for follow-up, the only thing that's said in the guidelines are get an echo every one to two years. Um, that's probably not sufficient, particularly in people who begin to demonstrate these at-risk characteristics. So beyond the hypothesis generating on load trial, we have just initiated a new study called PROGRESS. PROGRESS is a study of moderate calcified aortic stenosis, people over the age of 65, they are randomized one-to-one. -one. It's a large trial that will be probably about 750 patients to either TAVR with the newest version of a balloon expandable valve and clinical surveillance. Um, there'll be a primary endpoint of two years, which is mortality stroke and unplanned hospitalization. And we'll follow these patients up to 10 years. Now, who are the patients we're following? As I said, they're over the age of 65. They have moderate aortic stenosis by classic echo criteria, but they have one of these seven at-risk features. Either they're symptomatic, have reduced ejection fraction, diastolic dysfunction, low stroke volume index, AF, biomarkers, or elevated calcium score. So we screen these patients. If they have one of these characteristics, then they get randomized. And we just began this clinical trial. So the idea is that when we think of aortic stenosis, yes, we should always be looking at the grade of severity of the aortic stenosis, but we should also be staging from the standpoint of cardiac damage as well. And if we look at that right now, these green boxes represent guideline approved indications for treating aortic stenosis. What we think is that when we have data from these two trials, early TAVR, the PROGRESS trial, will begin to fill in some of these yellow boxes of moderate AS or even severe asymptomatic AS more intelligently to make a decision about whether or not preemptive AVR would be recommended in a given patient. And this is the first patient that was enrolled in the PROGRESS trial, Philippe Genero, who's one of the co-PIs, uh, was the operator, and this is his team at Morristown Medical Center uh, in New Jersey. Now, as interventionalists, we think of all ways to be able to um, uh, use catheters to be able to uh, create 
uh, an, an end effect at a target location. One of the things that we've been considering is, do we truly have to replace the valve in everybody? Um, so we've been exploring some interesting work with aortic valve remodeling, which is basically an aortic valve repair technique. This happens to be a device that was developed in Israel. It's had eight years of study, is in clinical trials, and will be beginning an early feasibility study in the US in 2022. It's an aortic valve scoring device that improves valve flexibility and reduces stenosis. So this is meant to be, balloon valvuloplasty is a palliative procedure. This is meant to be, we hope, a standalone procedure that could alter the natural history of calcific aortic stenosis. This is an, an example of a single case showing a very substantial increase in the valve area after using this scoring technique. Uh, and these are some of the necropsy specimens that were used to really validate this concept. Uh, it's taken almost a decade of work in over 3,000 surgically excised heart valves to really develop these techniques. But if you can interrupt these calcium bars in specific locations with a scoring technology, you can significantly improve leaflet flexibility. Now, how durable that's going to be, we're not sure. And that's the purpose of the work that's being done. There's already a very significant amount of work that's being done in the global clinical program that is in Europe, Israel, China, and starting in the United States. That's an example of one of several valve remodeling therapies, which you'll see emerge over the next several years. Now to conclude, I wanna end by talking about pharmacotherapeutics for aortic valve disease. Most of us, when we talk to patients, when we speak to our referring doctors, we say, if you have aortic stenosis, frankly, there's no way to treat them. There's no pharmacologic therapy. And it's a mechanical problem and a mechanical treatment. Um, I'm not so sure that that's correct. Certainly up until now, we haven't come up with good choices, but there's a rich literature and there is now an inflection point in studying, again, pharmacotherapeutics for aortic valve disease. Many manuscripts are in the literature uh, over the years. Most recently, this manuscript that just appeared about two weeks ago, which is a Jack state-of-the-art review of medical therapy for calcific aortic stenosis, Brian Lindman should be given all the credit for this. We worked with him on this, but some very high quality people involved, including Philippe Pibero, Mark Dweck, Catherine Otto. These are some of the real innovators in pharmacotherapy approaches to aortic stenosis. Now, Mark Dweck in a manuscript last year, to me had one of the nicest pathophysiologic descriptions of aortic stenosis in the modern era. Certainly there's an initiation phase at the valve leaflet level, which does involve oxidized lipids, certainly involves some pro-inflammatory mediators. At some point that extends into a propagation phase and that propagation phase is also mediated by varying degrees of calcification as well. In parallel, there's a myocardial remodeling phase where we progress from hypertrophy to diffuse interstitial fibrosis, to replacement fibrosis over time. And these represent some of the targets for pharmacointervention, working against the oxidized lipids at an early stage, being able to develop anti-calcification approaches in the early propagation phase, and how to manage fibrosis when there's concomitant myocardial remodeling. But as of today, there are no known proven medical therapies to slow or prevent the progression of calcified aortic valve disease. In that same manuscript, there were many um, futuristic approaches that were mentioned, and they're listed here. I'm not gonna go into detail. These are all randomized trials that were initiated and begun. But to be honest, a lot of this started about 15 years ago in the so-called statin era of medical therapy for calcified aortic valve disease where it was assumed that AS was simply a degenerative process, um, similar to atherosclerosis with similar risk factors. So it should be potentially modifiable uh, as an atherosclerotic disease. So therefore let's use statin therapy. There've been eight studies done, three significant randomized trials. Saltier was the first in 2005 with a Torvastatin. The largest was the SEAS trial 
uh, in, in 2008 with simvastatin, and most recently astronomer in 2010 with rosuvastatin, none of which showed important differences in aortic stenosis progression in patients treated with statins. So this created a fairly negative impression that medical therapy and statins in particular were ineffective as treatments. Soon after that, there was interesting work in the New England Journal of Medicine on, on LP little a, which now became the dominant target that people began thinking about based upon this very interesting um, um, uh, gene um, uh, approach identifying an association between LP little a and aortic valve calcium. So a lot of work is now being directed to LP little a. It's fairly common. Uh, circulating levels can be mitigated by certain drugs, not with the effect that we would hope, and there were some really interesting early studies looking at oligonucleotide antisense directed to APOA, which dramatically reduces LP little a with minimal side effects. And these are the kinds of things we expect to see in future clinical trials. So aortic stenosis is modified, we believe, by things like atherosclerosis, osteoblastic disease, even systemic hypertension has an effect uh, on the cardiac damage each of these cause a variety of pathophysiologic events that can be targeted with interesting agents like PCSK9 uh, inhibitors. Um, ACE and ARBs are being used, bisphosphonates, and other ways to be able to affect osteoblastic disease. And this is a more modern approach to medical therapy. Philippe Pibero has really made some important strides in this area and has identified uh, and uh, that there are many promising targets, um, has been involved in several randomized trials uh, and feels strongly that it's um, not one drug that fits all and that we need to be a little bit more prescriptive according to age, sex, the aortic valve phenotype and severity in terms of choosing drug therapies. So he's developed a stratified approach to how we divide up the AS population and preferentially use at various stages different drug therapies. And this is gonna be the source of a series, we believe, of randomized pharmacotherapy trials in the future. But if you look today at um, clinicaltrials.gov, and if you look for medical therapy trials for calcific aortic valve disease, although several are mentioned, there isn't a single trial right now that's actively enrolling. So there has been a real stagnation of uh, applying some of the concepts that we're developing to actual clinical trial reality. Brian Lindman has written about this in some recent perspective pieces in circulation with David Merriman and pointed out that there are several challenges and barriers to doing these pharmacotherapy studies that we're trying to overcome using some innovative clinical trial techniques, techniques that are not dissimilar to some of the work that was done most recently looking at multiple different drugs to treat COVID-19. We're also recognizing that trying to affect and mitigate calcific aortic stenosis is a two-part process, and that we need to manage not just the valve, but the myocardium, because heart failure is clearly the most common admitting diagnosis, and the residual risk from heart failure is primarily due to cardiac remodeling and irreversible injury. So before the onset of symptoms and before AS is severe, chronic pressure overload from years of AS leads to a series of changes, and those changes potentially can be affected with pharmacotherapy. So there's much new work being done now to try to see if we can manage aortic stenosis, not just at the valve leaflet level, but at the myocardial level with adjunctive medical therapy, using RAS inhibition, possibly um, um, uh, and Tresto, um, um, Arnie's, or SGLT2 inhibitors. All of these are studies that are in development right now that you should expect to see shortly. So medical therapies for calcified aortic valve disease um, certainly are advancing. You haven't seen it yet in the literature. It hasn't hit clinical practice yet, <clears throat> but as you scroll to the next decade, you can anticipate that this is gonna have an impact both at the valve and at the myocardial level, uh, that the novel insights we have on valve and myocardial pathophysiology will lead to some very interesting molecular targets 
uh, that will evoke some novel new therapies, that a multi-drug approach to precisely target disease is probably more realistic and promising, and that we need to really energize the clinical trial process and include things like non-invasive imaging modalities such as CT calcium scoring and um, uh, sodium fluoride PET or, or MRI to assist in both risk stratification and to develop surrogate clinical endpoints. So we're looking very creatively at the future of pharmacotherapy for AS. So let me conclude by showing this chart again and saying that we wanna fill all these boxes. Uh, you know, nothing is perfect and we're aspirational in, try in trying to manage what is a lifelong disease that affects um, um, uh, in the United States alone, uh, over the age of 65, 5% of the population. We think that a multi-drug precision medical therapy approach is gonna be somehow integrated into therapy at earlier stages and grades of severity and that we'll learn from additional, more device-based trials, either aortic valve replacement, aortic valve remodeling, let's see, um, to be able to manage more severe degrees of aortic stenosis in the future. So this is the vision that we're trying to propose that needs to be studied if we're serious about what we call the upstream management of aortic stenosis. So I'll conclude by saying that you can't solve upstream problems downstream, and the approach that many of us have taken is to say that we've learned a lot, we've developed new technologies, we need to more accurately diagnose at an earlier stage this disease, and we need to now apply some of the knowledge that we have and test some innovative therapies and go beyond the feeling that only aortic valve replacement uh, is an appropriate therapy, but there may be other therapies that we can also consider in patients in various stages of the life journey of aortic stenosis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Leon, um, for this excellent presentation. I'll open, up it, I'll open it up to Dr. Han Lee or Dr. Betrovec to see if they have any comments and then we definitely have some questions for you. Yeah, good morning, Marty. Thanks so much for uh, taking your time and enlightening us. Um, I just had a, a quick question. We didn't um, discuss this morning uh, regarding longevity of some of these transcatheter valves. If we were to think about um, earlier replacements in patients, for example, with moderate aortic stenosis to prevent some of the long-term sequela, what, what are your thoughts on uh, longevity you know, placing a, a transcatheter valve in a, you know, relatively healthy 55-year-old. What, what are your thoughts there? And what research is going on in that space? Now, that, that's certainly a, it's a foundational question. We're obsessed with this um, because until we deal with the, the um, uh, durability issue of these bioprosthetic valves, then we really can't propose um, widespread early use, um, because we know in younger people, there's probably going to be even more accelerated valve degeneration. So hand in hand, we'll have to be an appreciation that we need to both study and improve bioprosthetic valve durability. Now, there are some early trials being developed. There are many different genres of new versions of either bioprosthetic or polymer-based um, valves. Um, but certainly, until we can say that we have um, by a variety of methods and reasonably proven methods, more durable valves, then it's very hard to suggest that in the younger population, and that's why these studies, you know, have a, um, a, a, a basement age of 65, that in younger patients that we should be proposing um, uh, earlier therapy in an early stage of disease when the iatrogenic disease of bioprosthetic valve replacement may be as severe as the underlying disease. So I think that you know, these are aspirational goals and go hand in hand. Right now we have good five-year data. We feel pretty confident that the five-year durability is real. We've got data up to eight years in some cohorts. We've extended all the studies out to 10 years. So we'll have 10-year data in the next couple of years that will give us some insights. We have uh, many of the new systems now um, involve modifications of the leaflet 
um, uh, um, technology that should be somewhat more durable. But you know, these are obviously difficult things to study because you've got to wait 10, 15, 20 years before you can get an actual reasonable durability measure. Although some of the um, interesting um, imaging technologies might provide some earlier insights into durability and that also needs to be explored. But you're right, Greg, you know, until we can um, um, understand uh, and solve some of the durability issues, we should be very careful in proposing in young patients uh, bioprosthetic valves. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation today, the clarity and just putting this all together for us. We, we really appreciate it. Marty, thank you very much. This is George. I'm uh, really honored that you uh, were grateful to, uh, grateful to you for doing this. So thanks very much. It was, it was wonderful. I, I have a quick question. You were talking about modifying the valves and you talked about mechanical approaches. I wonder about you know, there's obviously damage. We've, we've done that through stents and balloons and so forth. So you wonder about that. I was wondering about other uh, energy sources, maybe ultrasound, I, I'm, I'm making them up. What, what other energy sources might work? Well, there are several um, and there is, um, and there've been several looking at um, a high frequency ultrasound uh, and shockwaves. So the company Shockwave that you're familiar with that does intravascular lithotripsy um, has developed and is developing an aortic valve treatment approach. Um, and it's been demonstrated on the bench that you certainly can um, um, have significant effects on, on um, uh, uh, fragmenting the calcium, which is usually encapsulated um, and improve valve leaflet flexibilities. So you're gonna see a combination of energy and mechanical approaches, George, that will certainly in the short term, uh, improve the ability to remodel stenotic valves. The real question I have is we can get the valve area up to 1.4, 1.5, maybe even 1.6 with some of these techniques. I don't know if we're gonna have the same problem we had with balloons, which is early recurrence. We don't have enough data. We'll have enough data probably in the next two or three years, but it's not just a matter, I think, of improving the initial result. We've gotta be able to sustain that result for at least a reasonable period of time to say that we've had an important impact on the natural history. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Leon. Thanks, Dr. Hunley and Dr. Vetrovec. I have a few more questions for you, Dr. Leon. So a few years ago, Medicare extended the TAVRs to more centers. Um, and recently in Jack, there was an article in August actually that came out that showed that uh, density of TAVR sites was associated with more cl at worse clinical outcomes. And so if we're moving in a direction where possibly at some point uh, we're going to be intervening on patients with moderate aortic stenosis, um, with the concerns that access may be an issue for some people, um, how do you suggest we disseminate these centers? How do you suggest we make sure that patients who do seek out or see someone for these TAVRs um, are... are have better outcomes compared to what we saw in August, the paper that came out in August. Yeah, that was a manuscript that came out of the TVT registry and they do some very good work. And, um, um, and um, I, I wasn't involved in the analysis or in the editorial. Uh, um, um, my good friend, um, uh, David Holmes was one of the authors of the editorial. I, I actually disagreed with the editorial. Um, uh, uh, there's no question that that the dissemination of TAVR is not perfect. Um, I would argue the dissemination of heart valve surgery for aortic stenosis is also not perfect. Uh, if you realize that the mean number of aortic valve replacements done surgically um, 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 uh, in a center in the United States is eight per year. Um, uh, and there's a direct relationship with surgical mortality and length of stay and all kinds of things relating to uh, surgical volume. Um, so to a large extent, the TAVR model has followed some of the surgical models with some variation. Um, and um, I would agree that um, uh, even with an increased density of TAVR centers um, surrounding urban areas where the ride time and access is now improved, that that hasn't caused a concomitant improvement in procedural mortality, probably for several reasons. 
Um, but the other thing that I would look at um, is that true, the overall mortality was, was not improved uh, in these higher density regions that had more tavern centers, but the absolute differences were a fraction of a percent. Um, and when you look at the total mortality of patients with aortic stenosis, being able to treat that many more patients still save many more lives, um, but we have more work to do to be able to make certain that even in the lower volume, high density environments, that the mortality um, uh, um, uh, is as low as it can be. Um, so it, um, it's by no means perfect, um, but um, I do think that we've um, uh, improve the overall mortality of aortic stenosis by layering in the availability of a less invasive procedure. And we need to uh, have ways to be able to identify centers that are underperforming and to uh, um, uh, insist that best clinical practices and remedial um, uh, approaches to improve outcomes be engaged. That's kind of step two of the TVT registry. And one of our main goals in the Heart Valve Collaboratory to try to, at the site level, improve clinical outcomes. Thank you so much, Dr. Leon. I have a few more questions, if you don't mind. Um, so other than the patients that Dr. Hanley just mentioned, our younger population, um, those who um, need to be intervened as far as their aortic valve is concerned, do you, do you think that at some point the TAVR should be a default to, to surgery, to SABR? <laughs> Well, again, I think that that um, I'm a strong believer in you know in in you know in the future. I think patient preference is going to be important. I think this concept of shared decision making is important. Uh, we were one of the, the strong proponents of the heart team, so this is a discussion with patients, um, and they need to have all of the information. And everybody's got to be at the table, and we do that routinely in our heart valve clinic. Um, so when we say default in older patients over the age of 80. I think if somebody has good anatomic characteristics uh, for TAVR, uh, that would certainly be uh, my preferred recommendation. Uh, under the age of 65, and these numbers shouldn't be strict absolute cutoffs, but in that range, um, I would say for the uh, exact reasons that Greg mentioned, the durability issue mostly, and the need for sequential procedures, that surgery would probably be the better choice among the two. And between 65 and 80, I think it really it depends a lot on the patient, what their expectations are, what their activity is, what other concomitant diseases they have, uh, what the expectation of TAVR and surgery might be in that individual from the standpoint of outcome and recovery. Um, and I think either approach would be appropriate based upon weighing those clinical and anatomic factors. So default is a strong word. And certainly in the elderly population, that's the one that I would target. Uh, and in the 65 to 80 year group, I think it's, uh, I wouldn't say toss up, but I would say that, that, you know, it really deserves a very serious discussion. I will tell you that most recently in the TVT registry, the last quarter analysis, about a third of the patients that are getting TAVR are in so-called low risk categories, which means um, uh, an STS score of less than uh, three or four. So it is moving in a direction where many of those 65 to 80 year olds are getting TAVR now. Thank you so much, Dr. Leon. I have one more question, please. And um, I mean, you've, you've been working with, for, with the aortic valves for decades now. Um, how do you, where do you see, and this is, I'm slightly bringing in a, a different valves here. Where do you see interventions on the mitral valve and tricuspid valve going? Um, can you, it's slightly a little different from <laughs> a aortic valve, but just wondering where, where you see the technology going and do you see that we're gonna make progress as much as we soon, as much as we did in, when it comes to the aortic valve? You, you know, everybody assumes first, everybody assumes that the, that the TAVR revolution occurred overnight. Uh, we're approaching the 20th anniversary of the first in man case done by Alain Cribier, who I saw last week. Um, it took us a long time to develop this technology. Um, and you know, we've been certainly encouraged. There've been over a million people treated with TAVR, um, uh, which is uh, not something we ever would have imagined in the early days. Um, and everybody assumes, well, if this model worked, why shouldn't it work the same way for mitral and tricuspid disease? Well, because they're completely different diseases. 
Uh, and, uh, and there's a whole level of complexity uh, that I would, I would absolutely not assume that either mitral or tricuspid valve replacement will follow the same course um, as what we've seen with TAVR in the aortic valve. I will say that um, uh, for the mitral and tricuspid, uh, first of all, surgery is a very, very significant alternative, particularly for primary MR. Um, uh, not so good for tricuspid disease, so you have to consider that. Medical therapy is an important component of treating secondary MR because these patients um, largely present with heart failure. And uh, to a large extent, the MR is secondary to myocardial disease. So that has to be factored. And the ability to put valves in the center of the heart uh, is more complicated. Uh, so there are many other anatomic considerations. I've been one of the co-PIs of the Apollo program, which is a mitral valve, the intrepid valve. We've been working for seven years and we're just scratching the surface um, and we're doing randomized trials, but it's gonna take more time, especially in the mitral valve to develop sufficient evidence to understand a cohort that's gonna be a good responder cohort. I'm more optimistic in the tricuspid side and we've got some accelerated work being done in tricuspid regurgitation indicating to me that we're gonna be developing some more rapid solutions with both repair and replacement that are certainly gonna manage the symptomatic patients and even also um, interfere with the natural history of tricuspid disease. So I'm a little bit more bullish on our ability to intervene in tricuspids. Um, uh, and I think we need to be, uh, we, we need to have a, a toolbox approach of multiple um, um, uh, uh, therapies to be able to manage um, uh, mitral disease for sure. Great, thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Leon. Um, well, if there are any more questions, it's 8.31. Um, so we're, we're gonna break off. Thank you so much for attending our grand rounds. Great. Thanks again, thank Marty. You.